Hi everyone, thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Alexa and I am the brand manager of Spine at Globus Medical. And today I have with me Dr. Jason Zook from UNC Blue Ridge in North Carolina. Dr. Zook, thank you so much for being with us today. Thanks for having me on. Yes, absolutely. So first to get us started, can you please tell me a little bit about your background in education? I am an orthopedic spine surgeon currently practicing in Morganton, North Carolina. Uh, my background is I went to college, university at Wake Forest University, uh, and I stayed there for medical school. And then I went to Chicago, Illinois, for uh, University of Illinois, Chicago, for an orthopedic residency. And after that, I spent a couple of years doing general orthopedics in Naples, Italy, with the United States Navy. Uh, after that, I did a fellowship at Leatherman Hospital in Louisville, Kentucky, which is a combined orthopedic and neurosurgical fellowship. And after that, uh, we went to Portsmouth, Virginia at the Portsmouth Naval Hospital, uh, where I was the department chair of uh, spine uh, at uh, the Naval Hospital there, a teaching hospital. And then after I uh, paid off my, my debt uh, to, <laughs> to society uh, and the military, I got into private practice, and I've been in private practice since 2013. So we're coming up on a 10-year anniversary for uh, private practice in North Carolina. So I've kind of been around a little bit. Yeah, that's amazing. So clinically, why prone lateral? I think uh, prone lateral is the next logical uh, evolution in our progression in spine surgery uh, towards getting uh, more efficient in what we do for patients. Uh, you know, prone lateral position in general has been uh, one wonderful addition to a surgeon's armamentarium over the years uh, allows us to gain access to the spine in a less invasive way, less collateral damage, uh, less complication rates, and still able to get a large implant in the disc space, uh, help uh, correct deformity. And so it's been a wonderful advent in spine surgery over the last uh, 10 to 15 years or longer, really. Uh, but the problem traditionally with lateral surgery is the extra positioning of a lateral position. Uh, and so it takes a, a lot of extra time and setup in the OR to get the patient in a proper position for a good lateral surgery. Uh, you are able to place hardware from a lateral position, but for some, many surgeons, that's somewhat technically demanding. Uh, and finally, decompression from a lateral position is very uh, technically demanding, uh, and most surgeons don't feel comfortable doing that. Uh, and so the prone lateral was the next logical kind of evolution of this so that most every spine surgeon is familiar with the prone position. You're still able to get the benefits from a lateral-based approach to the spine and with implant placement, but you're now in a prone position. You've, you've eliminated that extra step of patient positioning, and you're in one position throughout the surgery. Can you please walk me through your workflow as well as the procedure? What steps do you follow for a prone lateral? Sure, that's a great question. Uh, you know, first we try to plan out ahead of time, obviously, our, our planned procedure. I do tend to use, however, intra-op. Uh, mm -hmm. Again, um, you can use a pre-op CT and emerge and plan your your procedure ahead of time, or you can do an intra-op. E either way, uh, whenever you're more comfortable, and of course, what uh, maybe uh, you have available to you at your uh, hospital. But we get the patient in the operating room, and uh, we place them in a prone position. Uh, I, for example, use an OSI uh, table. Uh, we place them on a, a Jackson, open Jackson frame so mm -hmm. that the, the abdomen can hang freely. Uh, we place them up the arms in a, what we call a Superman position. Uh, we want to make sure the head and neck are appropriately positioned. The arms are well padded. All, all the same things you would do uh, in a traditional prone procedure. I tend to still like to flex the knees a bit and place the lower legs under uh, padded pillows. Uh, and then we make sure, obviously, uh, everything's hanging free. There's no pressure points. Uh, on anything before we get started. Uh, the next step that's unique to the prone lateral procedure is the positioner. Mm -hmm. uh, we have both uh, hip and uh, chest bolsters, padded bolsters. These things can rotate both uh, cranially or caudally. They can tilt in and out. That allows us to accommodate various patient body habitus uh, that we can kind of uh, make it uh, custom for that patient that we get safely secure them. Mm -hmm. Once we get these bolsters uh, positioned on both sides, we then can take these Velcro straps that will go from the chest bolsters from side to side and the th hip and thigh bolsters. And then we have a counterforce brace. Now this thing is really important. Uh, we talk about impaction forces. One of the issues with prone lateral that's unique and uh, different than a traditional lateral is that when we are malleting in, such as trials or an implant, when we're in a traditional lateral procedure, we have the table that's like our counterforce, okay? Mm -hmm. And when you're in a pro 
prone position, you don't have anything traditionally on the other side that's going to help kind of give you a counterforce. And so this pad is really important to have there and to help stabilize the patient. And so you want to make sure you put that in there if you can. And then once we uh, get that pad in there, we are, we are set up. And at this point, there's a decision tree that needs to happen. If you are a intra-op planner, uh, then you can if you need and feel it's necessary to induce that coronal break. There is a ratcheted uh, device at both the chest as well as the hip positioner that you can open this up or close it and you can adjust it to whatever makes sense for you and it, it makes sense for the patient. Uh, once this was is completed, then you would move forward to standard uh, uh, prep and drape. Uh, if you are going to be doing a pre-op merge, you are going to hold off, in my opinion, on, on doing that break and wait till a later point in the procedure. These, these uh, devices are very accessible during surgery, so if you need to wait and have someone on, underneath the sterile drape go in and open that up, it's very easy to be done. Um, once we get the patient sterile prepped and draped, we're going to proceed with then placing our reference markers. So this is going to be the quattro spike and the surveillance marker. Uh, we, we place them in, in the PSIS on both sides. Uh, I tend to put the DRB or quattro spike with the DRB on the side that I'm going to be approaching on with the lateral. Uh, and then we put the surveillance marker on the contralateral side. Um, this is a little bit different than a traditional uh, prone procedure with a T-lift where you can put those markers on either whatever you choose to do. Uh, you want to make sure that when you're placing that spike, the quattro spike, that you're allowed and able to put the quad, uh, reference frame in a manner that you're going to be able to see uh, from the, the lateral approach to the patient and, and still not be so far tilted that you would still be able to place the, the screws from a prone position. Mm -hmm. Once we've done that uh, and we've got everything draped out, we've registered uh, the, all the equipment, we've held all, usually that's being done uh, kind of simultaneous to all this going on, uh, then we're ready to kind of bring the OR in or the similar type of intraoperative uh, scan if you're going to do that, or we would be attaching the appropriate device to the C-arm to do a, a merge. Uh, and once we've gotten merged, we've got our plan. So once we've done either the intraoperative imaging or the pre-op and merge uh, sequence of events with the fluoroscopy, then our next step is to proceed with surgery. Again, I recommend placement of screws first. Uh, and so we're going to be placing these with the, the robot or we're going to be placing these with uh, navigation, depending on uh, what your options are available to you. Uh, once we place the screws, uh, we're going to then, in my opinion, if you need to do decompression work, to go ahead and do that laminectomy and or facetectomies. You can certainly do a mi traditional midline surgery. Uh, you can do cortical screws. You can do wiltsy style screws. That's, again, another benefit of the prone position is you're not uh, limited in the type of uh, trajectory uh, you, you want to place hardware. So if you're a, a cortical screw person, I love cortical screws. I can do my laminectomy, place cortical screws. I'm not limited. I don't have to do, I can, I can make my choice based on body, body habitus. If the patient's a little bit larger, soft tissue window, maybe you want to do the cortical screws. You can do that. That's the nice thing. You have choices. You have freedom for that. Once you've done the decompressive work, then my rec next step is to go towards the, the lateral position. Uh, we use a navigational array. You can call it a chicken foot or turkey foot or navigation, <laughs> whatever you want to call it. But we use that to mark our proposed incision. Uh, so instead of taking a fluoro scan and taking a bunch of x-rays to try to find that lateral disc space, now we're using navigation. So you can find your trajectory. You're going to have that pre-planned uh, cage already in the disc space. And when you're actually finding yourself online or on trajectory, you will get a green screen telling you, hey, you're lined up uh, with the trajectory that you plan. Now, mm -hmm. you may decide at that point, well, I don't really like the look of that trajectory. That's the nice thing as well. I can go to the screen and it's a sterile monitor. We can go ahead and change that plan. If you feel like, hey, you know what, my, my, I think I've changed things. Uh, once we've uh, decided we like the plan. We then mark the posterior aspect of the disc space. We tend in prone lateral to also mark the posterior aspect of the spinal canal. Uh, in prone lateral surgery, the tendency is for things to migrate towards the floor. Mm -hmm. There are major vascular structures we want to steer clear of ventrally. So the tendency is to recommend to try to air being more dorsal, okay, and that's more more safe for us. So, I mark. I tend to recommend marking the back of the spinal canal. We mark the back of the disc space. We mark the front of the disc space on the skin, and then wherever your planned 50 yard line or 30 yard line, wherever your planned uh, placement is going to be, and that's surgeon preference. At that point, we're going to make an incision similar to what we would do for lateral. We would dissect through the various fascial layers, the external obliques, the internal obliques. 
Uh, we are dissecting in line with the muscle fibers. Uh, one thing I like to recommend to do, and I do myself, is I take that navigational array, and before I go through each muscular layer, I make sure am I, am I where I think I am, if I'm going to say be at the 50-yard line, before I go through those muscle fibers, I line it back up again and make sure. Uh, that's your opportunity. Once you make a dissection through those muscle fibers, the, the, you tend to be kind of held in that area unless you're going to come back out and re-dissect and then do potentially more muscle damage. So use your opportunity now while you're going down to make it perfect, right? And so uh, after you've gone through the external oblique, we do that through the internal oblique and down, down to the transversalis. Uh, we use curved scissors to go through that, and you carefully uh, go, go enter the retroperitoneal space just like you would for a traditional lateral surgery. I do recommend at that point to do a blunt dissection. We take your surgeon should take their finger in there and sweep ventrally, sleep dorsally, make sure you can palpate the transverse process, try, palpate the psoas, make sure there's no adhesions uh, such, such as bowel or anything in the way. Mm -hmm. At this point, I'm bringing handheld retractors in. We're visualizing the psoas. I do tend to like to split the fascia of the psoas, again, making sure I'm where I think I am with navigation. Mm -hmm. All these types of little steps would require bringing the C-arm back in and out, back in and out, more x-rays. Um, and so then we're dissecting down to the psoas. And just to mention dissecting down in visualization, I, should, I would be remiss if I didn't mention one of the extra benefits of this positioner is that uh, you have the ability to either do this surgery from a standing position or doing it from a, a seated position. The issue when you have non-navigational based systems is that you are limited by the ability of the C-arm to keep yourself collinear and a, a true lateral, true AP imaging. And that limits your ability to a large extent. And so a lot of times you end up having to sit. And if you're not comfortable sitting, you, can st you need to be able to stand. And mm -hmm. so with this navigation, we can raise this table as high as we need to. We can get that, that tilt that we need to. And it doesn't really affect us because the, the, the robot and the navigational system are all smart enough to know what we're doing. Mm -hmm. I will tell you that if you are going to use the uh, Excelsius robotic uh, attachment arm, uh, once you get that attached, uh, you should not make any adjustments to the patient position unless you're detaching that arm first. Anyway, getting back to the dissection, once we've dissected the psoas, we put your first dilator down, and this is just follows just like a traditional lateral approach. We're going to stimulate and make sure that we are uh, in a safe position in terms of no nearby neurologic structures. We place a guide pin. Uh, something that's unique, excuse me, uh, with a guide pin in uh, navigational surgeries, there's no way to track that guide pin. So we just get the guide pin in enough to know that the pin is in there. If you want to double check, you would need to bring a C-arm in at that point to double check where that pin is. And then we place a series of dilators uh, and dilate up and place our retractor. Uh, so this would be similar to any type of uh, traditional lateral surgery. And then we re attach it. Now we have two options. We can attach it to the table or we can attach it to the Excelsius GPS. And it's really kind of up, up to the surgeon's preference and what they have available once more. And then the rest of the surgery follows is with traditional surgery, the exception being now all of our instruments are navigated. So you can prepare the disc space, do the cob release contralaterally, curette, trial, all that without having to take a bunch of x-rays. Uh, and again, we know we have navigational accuracy to make sure our trajectory is in line with the trajectory we want. If you're in, a, if you got green on the screen, you know you're good to go. Mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, we go through the whole uh, procedure and then you place the implant again, placing the implant under navigation. The final step, however, if you're using an expandable cage, you do need to have a fluoroscopic uh, view to ensure that it's expanding appropriately and that your hardware is uh, where you want to be as it expands. I do recommend that. And then once you've got the cage expanded, you can, you can bring the C-arm back out and place a plate or place screws if you're going to be using uh, an ELSA. Uh, and uh, if you use a RISE-L, again, you can backfill that. And then you can close up as you would normally close, or if you want to wait to close until you've finished the rest of the procedure, it's really surgeon preference at that point. But that at that point, anything left you need to do posteriorly, bone graft, that sort of thing. We place our rods, mm -hmm. compress or distract if you need, that sort of thing, and then we close up. And so uh, that's kind of the traditional order of operations for that. Absolutely. Well, thank you, everyone, so much for joining us today. And thank you, Dr. Zuck, for thank being you. here. Thank you. All right. Appreciate it.